Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Nishcast. I am the Diggity Doodah Doc, Mr. Slippers. Back early in your week to discuss some rugby league things. We had a great win for the Warriors against the Dragons over in Brisbane for the NRL's Magic Round. So I'll be talking my way through that. Plenty to, plenty to digest there with regards to the Warriors and then... I'll extrapolate that bad boy out into a broader NRL conversation as well, as I always do early in the week. No reserve grade footy this week because we had the residence fixture. Don't really care what happened in that residence fixture, fixture, but I did discuss players from Aotearoa, Kiwi NRL players involved last week so check that out if that's your buzz otherwise if you're enjoying the niche cache enjoying the niche cast hit us up on patreon or anywhere else however else you want to support us do your best do what you can and keep the niche cache flowing through your veins because we're out here just serving up the content podcast written everything you can digest the warriors Getting up over the Dragons in Cody Nakarima's first game for the Aotearoa Warriors. And that's probably a good place to start because Nakarima's involvement wasn't huge. He didn't have a single kick, I believe, for the Warriors as Blake Green had 15 kicks and then a few other kicks were spread around. And that could be an issue i'll work my way through this i've got so much to discuss with the warriors so this is probably predominantly going to be a warriors conversation because i think this game against the dragons had a lot of little nooks and crannies that warriors fans should be interested in with regards to nicarima he was hugely in, in, instrumental in a couple of tries though um, playing down the left edge, so you had Blake Green on the right edge, and then you had Cody Nakarima on the left edge, and just the Nakarima speed factor set up tries. You didn't have Nakarima dribbling grubbers into the in goal. Nakarima's not a huge long kicker of the footy, um, so you had no Nakarima kicks, but what you did have was Nakarima running the footy and setting up his outside men. The, the speed Nakarima has to skip to the outside of a defender and then set up those around him is hugely beneficial to the Warriors. There was a try, I think it was the Peter Hickou's first try where he was just one-on-one with Zach Lomax and Cody Nakarima got the footy and then just got on the outside of Ben Hunt and put Peter Hickou on the outside of Zach Lomax. Zach Lomax was worried about Nakarima creeping over to the sideline. Hickou's one-on-one, he scores. Little little instances like that or giving the ball to Toe Harris and then getting an offload off Toe Harris. Nakarima's kind of run-first instinct sets up a defense for a lot of attacking flair on the back of it. And it didn't feel like a game in which Cody Nakarima was hugely involved. He did play second fiddle to green in the terms of kicking, but... His touches, his touches were quality. And that's what the Warriors need at this stage. They just need another quality half alongside Blake Green to help spark the attack into motion. Cody Nakarima had 44 touches and Blake Green had 61 touches. And then again, there's a huge disparity in the involvement of kicking as well between the two halves. So Blake Green's playing the, the predominant half the organizer the conductor setting things up and then Nicarima perfect role for him playing alongside Blake Green and I'm very interested to see how the combination with Roger Tuivasa Sheik develops over time Tuivasa Sheik had his own lovely moment down the right edge pretty even numbers and he ran direct, which is what Nakarima and Tuivasa Shek do in the good ball areas of the field. They run direct, lure in a few defenders, and then Roger Tuivasa Shek just came out and faked the kick, then threw a cutout ball. Ridiculous. Absolutely bonkers from Roger Tuivasa Shek. And that set up a try to David Fusatua. So that combination of Cody Nakarima and Roger Tuivasa Shek. 
is going to be very interesting to watch it develop over the coming weeks. Roger Tuivasa-Shek also set up a try on the left edge where Blake Green got the ball on the right side of the ruck and then he fired a pass back over to Roger Tuivasa-Shek, a play that we saw last season. And then Tuivasa-Shek, quick hands, he got it out to Toe Harris outside him. So good to see Tuivasa-Shek not just sticking to the right edge, that he also appeared on the left edge as well. And uh, if you've got Cody Nakarima popping up on either side of the ruck, if you've got Roger Tuivasa-Shek, popping up on either side of the ruck because the try that Tuivasa Shek set up on the right edge, Nikarima and Blake Green were both on the left edge. So it's very hard to set up your defense when you're eyeing up Blake Green and Cody Nikarima instigating something on the open side and then Tuivasa Shek's kind of one-on-one with even numbers down the short side. Not a great defensive position to be in. Like it's a kind of, it's as good as you're going to get with these three players in the Warriors' spine, but it's, it's definitely in favour of the Warriors. Like there's not too many teams who are going to stop Roger Tuivasa Sheik down a short side um, with the skill that he is playing with right now. Like yeah, enjoy the running meters, enjoy the involvement that we always see from Tuivasa Sheik, but run hard fake a kick, throw a cutout pass, that's just brilliance. The The style of this game was very interesting for me as well because it was a Warriors performance in which they stuck to their process, as you say, their scheme, their style of footy, and then it yielded results later in the game. A lot of people are hating on Blake Green's kicking game. It was said in the commentary that his kicking game was mediocre, borderline shit, because he just kept putting these bombs that were about three quarters the size of your standard up and under that a lot of other halves are putting up, he just kept, it was like on repeat, he just kept putting up these bombs, easy catch, not high enough or not not correct distance to get a good chase on those kicks. He was just putting up these kicks pretty much for no reason and that got a lot of negative feedback from different people. Even as I wrote about it, the feedback on Twitter and Facebook was, um, wasn't quite as open as what I'm suggesting you to be as a listener like here's my theory is that Blake Green was just doing his job the game plan was to keep the Dragons coming off their own end there's nothing those kicks aren't attacking kicks yeah sure you can make them attacking kicks by putting up a spiral bomb or put making them taller higher to allow your chasers to get underneath those foot that the the ball but Blake Green was just putting up the same kick over and over again, and I'm not going to say that Blake Green's that much of a silly bugger that he is going to do that at least 10 times. It was just over and over again. Like that To me, that feels like a clear plan and not the most exciting plan, but very, very effective because what happened is the Dragons had to keep coming off their own 20-meter line, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, and the Warriors kept showing up on defense. And then what happens later in the game? The Warriors score points, and they score points because Carl Lawton comes onto the field and tears the Dragons up through the middle because there's fatigue, because the Dragons have had to work out of their own territory over and over again. That has an effect. That has an impact on how effective you are going to be defensively and with the footy because there was some interesting decisions made by the Dragons players with and without the footy and obviously Ben Hunt's situation as well helped the Warriors but my point here is that I smelt a game plan I smelt a style of play that the Warriors were going to grind the Dragons down and stay in the game and then score points later on Again, it's not the sexiest tactic. It's not the most uh, highlight-worthy tactic of Blake Green just putting up these kicks again and again and again. But it worked because the Dragons had to put in so much effort just to get out of their own territory. There was no risk involved. The ball's not going dead. He's not risking a seven-tackle set. He's not risking putting the ball out of play because that's important here. Other teams, they want the Warriors... They want to put the ball out of play so the Warriors 
don't have this flow, that they don't, Roger Tuivasa, Sheik, Fusatua, Ken Mamalo, that they're not picking up the ball and charging and getting onto um, a quick play the ball. The Warriors, they want to keep the ball in play for this reason that it brings greater fatigue into the game and they can start to execute their game plan. So Blake Green, he doesn't want to risk putting the ball over touch. He doesn't want to risk, well that's not really a risk, that's a solid situation in itself, but he was clearly putting the kicks up into the middle of the field, you know, 10 to 15, 20 metres out from the Dragons' try line. And the, the only, like, it was so repetitive that there's only one conclusion that you can come from. Like, you can't think that Blake Green has a shit kicking game when he's just doing this over and over and over again. It's obviously a plan. And it worked because the Warriors ended up scoring a whole lot of points later on in this game. So that's, uh, like, sure, again, it's not like Blake Green was executing his the, his t- talents and potential to the best of his ability. It was, a, it was an aspect of play that was well within great Blake Green's ability. He wasn't pushing the boundaries, but again, it worked. It worked well. The Warriors stormed home. And part of that was via Carl Lawton coming onto the field as well as Lingy Sal. Lingy Sal had four offloads. He played a bit of middle and then he went over to the edge when Toe Harris left, left the field. Toe Harris came back and Lingy Sal, I think he went back into the middle, but those two were, you could say they were two of the more important Warriors on the field because when they came on, there was a, a change. Again, I think a lot of this stems from the set-for-set grind that the Warriors engage the Dragons in, and then you have Carl Lawton coming onto the field with tired ruck defenders, and he is making huge impact through the middle. He had, I think he had four dummy half runs for like 85 metres in limited game time, which is pretty damn impressive if you ask me. I think... I wrote this morning that Carl Lawton was 6th in dummy half runs in reserve grade, which is uh, pretty impressive. And he's very active out of dummy half for the Warriors against the Dragons. He only played 20 minutes, and he had 4 dummy half runs, whereas Nathaniel Roach, he had 2 dummy half runs in 60 minutes. Nathaniel Roach, I think he left the field with a back injury, which isn't good news for Nathaniel Roach, considering he's... He had a major back injury that kept him out of footy for a year, so obviously it will be very interesting to see what happens with regards to Roach and his back. But it was kind of annoying because Roach was taken off for Lawton, and then Lawton came off for Roach just after Lawton had been super active around the ruck and dummy half running. He played 13 minutes, Roach comes back on for seven minutes, Roach does his back, and then Lawton is back on for the last seven minutes, and that was that helped the Warriors immensely. Because Lawton is, he's not fast, <laughs> he doesn't look fast, he's not overly big or powerful, so I don't know what it is about Lawton that gets him bursting through those tackles. I do, again, I do think fatigue and the set-for-set set grind that the Warriors put the Dragons through uh, to start the second half, either side of half time, that middle stanza of the game, that had an effect, and Lawton was able to work his magic around the ruck. As for Lingy Sal, four offloads, I think he averaged like 8.4 metres per run, 10 runs for uh, 84 metres, which is pretty solid. Let me just confirm that. 83 metres, sorry, so 8.3 metres. Lingy Sal looks big, he looks mobile, he looks athletic, he's skillful, he's got good hands. And he should be in this Warriors 17, um, depending on what ha- happens with Adam Blair. But just focusing on this game and not looking too far ahead into the future, Lingy Sal took his opportunity. Came on the field, like Lawton added a certain X factor, a certain impact, a little bit of energy. Lingy Sal did the same. He came on, he was aggressive. Eager on defense, busy hitting the four, uh, ball up. He had 10 runs in 37 minutes. And like Lingy Sal played 37 minutes, 10 runs, 80, 83 meters. 
Lachlan Burr played 50 minutes, 10 runs, 82 metres. So Lingy Sal effectively did more than Lachlan Burr in 13 less minutes, which is kind of interesting considering they could be viewed as playing similar positions. I just like Lingy Sal. I like his... His rangy nature, he adds a bit of size, a bit of skill, something different to the Warriors, and having four offloads in the second half when fatigue is a factor, as I've alluded to many times so far in the first 16 minutes of this episode, if you are adding four offloads in to a fatigue defence after they've just chased Carl Lawton around, mate, you're, you're tearing them up, you're tearing them up, you're doing a, adding a lot of value to that Warriors team, so... Massive winners in this game versus the Dragons were Carl Lawton and Lingy Sal. It was a fairly solid display from the Warriors' middle forwards, and they held their own against a reasonably impressive Dragons forward pack as well. You Jazz Tavanga was back in. like That's another factor here. Jazz Tavanga didn't play last week, but he played this week. And he was in his busy lock forward role, playing 42 minutes, 11 runs, 96 metres, 32 post-contact metres, which you don't really associate with someone who has Jazz Tavanga's size, and a couple of tackle bus, one tackle bus, and an offload. Like that's, a, that's a typical Jazz Tavanga stat line if ever I've seen one. He was him, his normal self. And then the outside backs were standard, you know, pretty awesome. Kim Amalo, Fusatua, very busy running the footy. And Roger Tuivasa-Shek, his normal self. Patrick Herbert only had five runs for 20 metres, so he wasn't heavily involved. So plenty of room for growth there from Patrick Herbert. And the Warriors get the win. Just a solid all-round performance from the Warriors. The first half wasn't spectacular. It was kind of a dour affair until until I started to see like patterns and what was happening in the game. I thought it was a really boring game. It wasn't an attractive game. I wasn't captured by that game of footy until I started getting into the weeds of what was happening with regards to Blake Green's kicking game. Uh, the Warriors defensively, what they were doing, very compact and then sliding out and just pushing the Dragons towards the sidelines because what happened was the Warriors kept the lid on some reasonably intriguing Dragons attack. Like Jai Field showed how fast he was. Anytime Matt Dufty has the footy, you're paying attention because he's a little whippet himself. But the Warriors compacted their defensive line so those holes weren't there and they slid very nicely like we've come to view this Warriors defense as more of an aggressive defense pushing up jamming out on the edges but against the Dragons they kind of just sat back and gave the Dragons the sideline and you know did a fantastic job in doing so there wasn't too much of a threat out wide from the Dragons which is good news for the Warriors and that win doesn't do much for the Warriors on the ladder. They are 12th on 6 points. And 3 teams have 6 points at the moment. The Broncos, Warriors and Cowboys. Which is pretty good news for the Warriors. Because they're probably better than those 2 teams. And then the Dragons and Knights have 8 points. So the Warriors have 6 points on in 12th place. The Eels are 8th and they have 10 points, which is the same for the Sharks and West Tigers and the Seagulls. So the Seagulls are 5th on 10 points themselves. So the Warriors are only 4 points off 5th spot, which is a bit crazy when you think about it. But that's how the NRL is, very compact ladder and it's very competitive. Next up, the Warriors are away to the Penrith Panthers, I think. So it'll be an interesting game as well. And the, I believe the Jersey flag team had a win over the Roosters, which is a very good result for the flag team. As I said, no reserve grade footy. So we will slide on in to Kiwi NRL conversation from Magic Round up in Brisbane. 
The Sharks defeated the Titans. There's a bit of buzz around Braden Hamlin Uele at the moment, who is a Sharks middle forward. I think he is from Glenora Bears. He had previously gone by just Braden Uele. And now he's added the Hamlin to his game. He was in he's doing really well for the Sharks team that is kind of struggling for health and fitness and just getting their best team on the park. Hamlin Uelia had fifty six minutes through the middle, fourteen runs and hundred and twenty meters. So not the most efficient performance, but busy. Fourteen runs, hundred and twenty meters, and six tackle busts, two offloads, which is a very impressive stat line for a young uh, middle forward, and it's good to see Braden Hamlin Ueli getting a good run with the Sharks after moving down from the Cowboys a few years ago and battling away in reserve grade. The the stars have aligned for Hamlin Ueli to get good game time uh, with Cronulla. Also had the debut of Jesse Arthurs. He played 53 minutes and was, let me just pull up his running meters... What did Jesse Arthurs do with the 40? 11 runs, 108 metres, 41 kick return metres. So a fairly decent debut for Jesse Arthurs there for the Gold Coast Titans. And it'll be very interesting to see how uh, how he goes over the next few rounds and whether he can hold on to his spot in the... Gold Coast Titans top 17. He seems nicely suited to that bench roll at the moment. West Tigers versus the Penrith Panthers. West Tigers were too good for the Panthers. No surprises there. It's a bit of a shit show at the Penrith Panthers at the moment. And there was a bit of noise about Dallin White and Lesniak possibly being on the move, which... Probably stems from him. Panthers struggling, so anytime a team's struggling that shouldn't be struggling, there's noise about different players. But he's not playing fullback at the moment either, which I don't really care because I really like the work of Caleb Aikens playing at fullback for the Panthers, but that could be a situation to watch out for. Brisbane Broncos defeated Manly Seagulls. Unfortunately, we had Torfafoa Sipley. Uh, suffer an ankle injury for the Sea Eagles, which was a bummer because he was doing a fairly good job for the Sea Eagles uh, over the last few weeks. And the Brisbane Broncos, very low Kiwi and RL numbers, they defeated the Manly Sea Eagles. We also had, then we had the Bulldogs versus Knights, and that was a, a very solid win for the Newcastle Knights. They were too good for the Bulldogs, and I'm just interested in Offa Hickey Ogden's numbers for the Bulldogs coming off the bench. He had 29 minutes, 6 runs, 65 metres, so that's above the old 10 meter, ten metres per run mark, which is very handy for Offa, Hick- Offa Hickey Ogden. 6 tackle bus, So, and he's not like getting huge... Uh, game time here, 29 minutes and an offload as well. Very solid display from Offahiki Ogden. And here's someone to keep an eye on. Like, I keep talking about Ogden because his like the impact he has on the field coming off the bench is very easy. It's very noticeable. It's noticeable. And his stats back it up. Like He's always hovering around 10 metres per run. And... With that in mind, I'm also interested in Herman S.A. S.A. and James Gave from the Newcastle Knights and how they're going playing off the bench because James Gave was very quiet to start the season starting games and he's now settled into a, a better role for him, I think, coming off the bench because his, the statistics are reflect that. Herman S.A.S.A. played 26 minutes. James Gavre played 29 minutes. S.A.S.A. had 14 runs, 144 metres, so up around that 10 metre per run mark. And James Gavre, 11 runs for 108 metres. Very great involvement from James Gavre, considering where his statistics were before. They both had an offload. S.A.S.A. had eight tackle busts, and that's exactly the Herman S.A.S.A. that made his Kiwis debut last year. 
those are the sorts of numbers that demanded attention because 144 meters of 14 runs, eight tackle busts, that is huge, especially in only 26 minutes. Oh my golly, golly, gosh. Hermit SAS, slow start to the season, but he's back doing his thing. Then you had the Warriors defeating the Dragons. Melbourne Storm defeated Parramatta Eels. Melbourne Storm, I think you had Jerome Hughes from Wellington. He left the field with a bit of an issue after a shoulder charge to his face. Um, don't really worry about statistics in a blowout win like that. 64 points to 10. The Melbourne Storm. Don't ever talk shit about the Melbourne Storm. They are a fantastic footy team. And like Jerome Hughes had to go off injured and then suddenly this Ryan Pappenhausen dude comes on and he's a gun as well. Like that's just the Melbourne Storm doing their recruitment thing. Sydney Roosters versus Canberra Raiders. The Roosters, 30. The Raiders, 24. And some epic numbers here from the Roosters forwards. Wadea Hargraves and Sioso Tokiaho. Wadea Hargraves played 59 minutes. Tokiaho played 67 minutes. Tokiaho had 23 runs. And 263 meters. <laughs> what the fuck? 100 post contact meters as well for Tokiaho. No, uh, 100 kick return meters and then 68 uh, post contact meters. White Air Hargraves wasn't too bad himself. 16 runs, 144 meters. And Tokiaho is in vintage form. He had a tackle bus. White Air Hargraves had three tackle bus. And just check their offload numbers as well. Two offloads for Tokiaho. You could make a case that Tokiaho is as good, if not better, than Jason Tamalolo. Like I'll do a direct comparison for their statistics right now. Tomalolo played 63 minutes versus the Rabbitohs, 16 runs, 146 metres, so... Not the best performance from Tamalolo in losing to the Rabbitohs. And I will get onto his tackle count very soon. But I just want to give a big shout out to Otara Scorpion Jr. Tokiaho, who he is, yeah, he's definitely on the Tamalolo level. He's as mobile, as powerful, as dynamic as Jason Tamalolo. And he is part of a sublime Roosters team as well. So he's got he's got like the the club vibes are far better than the Cowboys. The Cowboys are reasonably mediocre at this stage. And I think that's having a, a bit of an impact on Tamalolo because it increases the expectation, hope and workload for Tamalolo. Whereas Tokiaho doesn't have to do what he does. It's just He's just out there playing footy, doing his job for his team, but he, he's not expected to roll out 23 runs for 263 metres. Like, that is absolutely ridiculous. But he's out here, he's doing it. He's doing his best job for his team, and it's a beautiful thing to watch because he's, he's, under, he's undercover. He's another one of these Tongan forwards, and he's someone who is... Had to work extremely hard to get to where he's got because he left the Warriors as an outside back. And shout out Roosters coach Trent Robinson who turned him from a a centre second row edge forward into a middle forward. And proof is in the pudding. Also impressive for the Roosters was Satili Tupanoya who had 6 runs for 74 metres in 42 minutes. And he was a busy bee as well. Tackle bust, offload, and a line break and try assist as well for Tupanuya. As for the Raiders, as for the ruggedy Raiders, we're still waiting on the big dogs. I think Jordan Rapina suffered a knee injury in that game as well. And Saliva Havili, 23 minutes. <laughs> Eight runs, 92 metres, well over the 10 metre, run, metre per run mark. Saliva Havili, middle forward, dynamic middle forward. 
Shans Nickel Clockstead, 17 runs, 172 metres. So a fairly impressive effort from C N K. And a try for CNK as well. Six tackle bus for the Raiders fullback. And that's yeah, that's it for the Raiders. But very interested in this like second tier Aotearoa Kiwis fullback situation because you've got Shans Nicol Clockstead, you've got Caleb Aikens or Watane Zelezniak, you have Jerome Hughes has been doing a great job for the Storm at fullback. None of them are as good as Roger Tuivasa Shek. But they're all playing fullback in the NRL and we've never really had that kind of situation where there's such an abundance of fullbacks doing reasonably impressive jobs for their respective NRL teams. Something to keep an eye on. Like you had the half situation. Now it's all about fullbacks. By half situation, I mean you had Dylan Brown in the halves. You had Timare Martin in the house for the Cowboys. Nick Rima in the house for the Broncos. You had Chanel harris Vita in the house for the uh, Warriors. You had Benji Marshall. You had all these Kiwi NRL halves doing jobs for their respective teams. Those numbers have decreased uh, for a variety of reasons, and now it's all about the fullbacks. It's all about the fullbacks with Nickel Clockstead, Caleb Aikens, Watane Zelezniak not even playing fullback, and Jerome Hughes for the Melbourne Storm as well. In this Rabbitohs versus Cowboys game, Tamalolo had to make 32 tackles. I think last week he only made like 20 tackles. Now suddenly he's making 32 tackles and his involvement just isn't quite as high. It's hard to have over 20 runs when you're making over 30 tackles. Let me just check that hypothesis with Siosu Tokiaho because I think it's a good ta- I think it's a good hypothesis. Just got to double check it, you know what I'm saying? Tokiaho, 28 tackles. So it's hard to have over 20 runs and over 30 tackles. Sure, Tokiaho had 28, which is barely less than 30. But for the purpose of this investigation, I'm bang on the money. Very difficult to have, well let me put it this way, it's very difficult to have over 20 runs, average 10 metres per run, and have 30 tackles. That's a triple threat that is very, very, very difficult to do in the NRL these days because if you're making 30 tackles, you're doing a heap of work and it's hard to maintain the efficiency running the footy. Also interested in the output of Jordan Kahu from this game. 17 runs, 147 metres, not too shabby from Kahu. He had a try, a couple of kicks. And a tackle bus. Yeah, a decent outing from Jordan Kahu. We've seen his run meters look a whole lot better recently than they previously had been, which is good news uh, for Jordan Kahu fans, which, as I said previously, I am one of. That battle between Tokiaho and Tao Malolo is going to be very interesting to watch over the coming weeks as we build into a Tonga fixture. I believe there's one coming up against the Aotearoa Kiwis. I'm not too sure when that is, but plenty of Tongan funk to enjoy. Off of Higgy Ogden, he's a Tongan forward. Rabbitohs have Tavita Tatola, Parramatta Eels, Penny Terapo, Manu Ma'u, Tokiaho, Tamalolo. Ignatius Parsi was part of the Tongan squad last year, but then was a last-minute pull-out to join the Kiwis on squad, but a niggle there, see see what happens there if he's welcomed back into the Tongan fold. Pangai Jr., what's going to happen with him? Plenty of interest around the Tongan team. Atta Hingano and Tui Lola here aren't playing NRL footy, so they had previously both been playing NRL footy in some capacity. Now Lola here is in England. Atta Hingano is playing for Mounties. Tonga don't have a starting hooker, Manasi Fainu. He's coming off the bench. Saliva Havili is playing as a middle forward off the bench for the Raiders. Siona Kato is playing as a every which utility man for the Penrith Panthers. Will Hopwadi is not playing fullback. He's playing centre. A lot of interesting questions around Tonga at the moment. Like They have the talent. They have the players. And as, I've, as I'm kind of highlighting here, they got a lot of players who are playing really well at the NRL level, but fitting them all in into key positions and coming up with a 17 who can win an international game of footy 
that's a different that's a different kettle of fish. So I'm very interested to see selections and how the Tongan team play whenever they're up next. Otherwise, that's it for Magic Round Wrap. I'll be back later in the week to preview uh, round 10 of the NRL and run through the team list to see any Kiwi NRL funk and, of course, offer a Warriors preview. Uh, They are away to the Penrith Panthers on Friday night at Panthers Stadium. So very interesting game. The Warriors are 12th, Panthers are 15th. And somehow the Panthers are favourites, even though they currently suck. Shout out to you all. Enjoy the niche case. Support the niche case, as I keep saying, on Patreon or otherwise. And I'll be back later in the week. Until then, stay tuned for a Game of Thrones podcast. And hopefully a cricket podcast as well. I'm feeling some cricket thoughts to discuss with the wildcard as we near and approach the World Cup. God bless, kia kaha, peace and love.